Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first Brentos webinar for 2023. My name is Brian Butchart, MD for Brentos Wealth, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this panel discussion featuring a distinguished group of speakers who have come together to share their expertise and views on both global and local investment opportunities while navigating volatility and the complex challenges across international markets. Magda Verzika needs no introduction. Magda is a qualified actuary with more than 20 years experience in the South African asset management industry and served as a board member of the Actuarial Society of South Africa. She started her career at Southern Life in 1993, followed by two years at Alexander Forbes and then Coronation Fund Managers as Head of Institutional Business and a Director. Magda left Coronation in 2003 to start IQVest, a fund of hedge funds company, and later that year sold IQVest to the African Harvest Group and appointed CEO of African Harvest. After negotiating the sale of African Harvest Fund Managers to KD's Financial Services in 2006, she led the management buyout of the remainder of the African Harvest Group, which resulted in the formation of Signia. Signia listed in October 2015 and currently manages more than 250 billion in assets under management. With an upcoming election in 2024, Magda will provide her views on coalition governments, municipal power and renewables as a hope for South Africa. Magda will also provide an update on the Oxford Science Enterprises Fund later this year in May, details to follow shortly. And if you haven't read her autobiography, Magda, My Journey, I highly recommend getting yourself a copy. Tony Bell uh, started his career, started his career in 38 years ago at Southern Life, appointed uh, CIO at Seifert's Managed Assets in 1994. In 2000, he accepted the opportunity to be one of the founding members of Peregrine Quant, which became Venani Fund Managers. Tony handed over the CIO role in 2019 and left in 2022 to pursue his dream of building Thinksell. He leads a highly skilled team in managing a suite of multi-asset and global equity portfolios, including the MyPlan IP Global Opportunity Fund for Brentoast. Tony was awarded his ninth consecutive Raging Bull Award this year, one of which is for the MyPlan IP Global Opportunity Fund. The MyPlan Tony Bell team has an impressive track record and since inception places them solidly in the first quartile over all periods longer than four years to the end of January 2023 and in the second and third quartile over all other periods. In November 2022, Brentist appointed Tony Bell and MyPlan to consult to Brentist on risk and asset allocation for the Brentist range of multi-asset fund of funds, namely the Brentist BCI Balance Fund of Funds, Brentus BCI Cautious Fund of Funds and the Brentus BCI Worldwide Flexible Fund of Funds. We're also excited to announce the launch of MyPlan's first US dollar fund managed by Tony to be included in Brentus's investment strategy. Tony will address the current US banking liquidity crisis and why inflation and recession are unlikely to be the, the main concern for the remainder of 2023, explaining why liquidity and volatility are far more critical. Finally, JC Lowe is the MD for DFM Global, starting his career at Greenwich Securities in London, becoming a member of the OTOB, European Derivative Exchange. JC then moved to Cape Town in 2000, where he joined Greenwich Asset Management as an investment analyst. He was part of the investment team that later became part of NIB. From 2001 to 2016, he worked as a private client portfolio and asset manager, and in 2016 acquired a controlling stake in the ShareNet Group and took on the role of CEO. In 2019, he facilitated the management buyout of the discretionary fund management, management and unit trust division to start DFM Global, focused on providing share portfolio solutions to the SA advisor. JC will be discussing the benefits of global personal share portfolios, a solution Brentus now offers their clients. Sorry, just excuse me one second. I'm just trying to get my slides to come up. Let 
Ladies and gentlemen, on the 28th of February this year, four days after South Africa's grey listing, a list of South Africa's top risk, risks published by the Institute of Risk Management South Africa flashed across Bloomberg terminals across the world. And I quote, South Africa, South Africa risks becoming a failed state if, it lacks a, if its lack of decisive ethical and courageous leadership persists and no action is taken to bolster economic growth and address high levels of poverty unemployment and inequality, according to the Institute of Risk Management South Africa. If South Africa continues to experience a continued breakdown of ethical or legal principles, unmanageable societal unrest and breakdown of the rule of law, complete economic collapse becomes almost inevitable. The nation's professional body for risk management said in a report published on their website in February. Domestically, government's failures are weighing on the rand. State-owned enterprises are a significant drag on our economy and currency. ESCOM is front and center of the rot, while Transnet and other parastatals are also rapidly deteriorating. Unfortunately, there's been very little to convince anyone there are meaningful plans to stem the decay. And foreign investors are talking with their feet. These are institutional investors and asset managers selling down our local bond and equity markets. This slide provided by DFM Global illustrates the massive cumulative flows from our local bond and equity markets since 2019. And if you, for, if you have a look at this slide, I know it's a little bit busy, but if you have a look at the top axis, um, all the sort of uh, movements upwards is, uh, is, is positive returns, whereas all the movements below that top axis um, on the top, top side is obviously flows out of South Africa. Now in 2019, that number finished off at a, at a massive 150 billion that flowed out of our bond and equity markets. In 2020, that number increased to 170 billion. In 2021, that number was a massive 350 billion. And last year, it closed at 370 billion that flowed out of our market. In 2023, so far this year, we have seen uh, just over 150 billion that has actually left the South African bond and equity markets. There are far more investable opportunities across international markets than there are in South Africa. The JSE All Share Index continues to shrink. In 2001, there were more than 800 listed stocks on the JSE with less than 300 today and declining as companies continue to delist from the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Long-standing clients of Brenthurst are aware we have been advising a higher offshore allocation across client portfolios for more than a decade for a number of reasons. The next two slides illustrates the annualized performance in US dollars and rands over one, five, 10, and 15 years of the S&P 500, a proxy for US markets, the MSCI World Index, the Broad Global Equity Index, and the NASDAQ 100, a basket of the largest 100 most actively traded US tech companies in the JSC All Share Index. As you can clearly see, the RAND uh, influenced uh, the, the all share in terms of its performance at minus 18.54, weakening at the same time, uh, considerably weaker than, than the rest of international markets. But the picture is the same across all periods, 5, 10, and 15 years, where all of the international indices have outperformed our local market by quite a substantial margin. And you can see the gray line at the bottom is the JSC pretty much moving sideways, although there was a little bit of a pickup over the last three years or so. And this is the US dollar comparison in terms of performance. Similarly, the RAND performance, the local market only gave you just under 1%, whereas you got double digit returns uh, from, from all of the uh, international indices. And, and the same picture applies over five, 10 and 15 years. The one-year numbers reflect the uncertainty and volatility as investors grappled with a range of challenges, including rising inflation, interest rates and geopolitical risks. Although past performance is never an indicator of future performance, Brentus expects high quality global equities to continue to provide the best opportunity to generate real returns. Locally, our allocation to South African income funds and bonds provide higher real return opportunities relative to cash. Low risk SK income funds are cheap and generate consistent returns of between seven and 9% per annum. Despite SA equities looking attractive on a relative valuation basis, we still favor Rand Hedge stocks over SA Inc. Ladies and gentlemen, we will have a Q&A at the end of the presentation, so please pose any questions where we will answer as many as time allows. On that note, please welcome Mark Davistica from Signia Asset Management.
Uh, well then, Brian, let me just uh, start the video so at least everyone can see me, hopefully, and see my. Yeah, we can see that, Magda. Perfect. Yeah, Okay, so, you know, just, just a comment, Brian. Unfortunately, in my view, we are a failed state. We became a failed state a while back. And uh, I don't think that there's anything on the horizon that is likely to change that in the near future. I think, and, and that leads into a couple of topics that I'm going to talk about. One of them is uh, great hope, uh, 2024 general elections. And this uh, idea that if ANC loses majority, coalition government comes in, you know, there is some uh, hope for the future. Well, you know, if a municipal elections are anything got to go by, we are looking at complete chaos of coalition governments. And really, we don't have to look any further than the city of Johannesburg and city of Tuana and what we have seen happen there. So you have these clobbered together coalitions, which are necessary because there isn't a single party that has a decisively sufficient vote to be able to um, outweigh ANC and any alliance that they might form. So as you can see, City of Johannesburg DA formed a clobbered together alliance just to see it in 2022 completely disintegrate as COPE and PA switched to ANC and EFF. And so City of Johannesburg is ANC and EFF controlled city of Tuane, not dissimilar, clobbered together coalition. And um, I think a few months ago, they were celebrating 2023, we are back to ANC, EFF and COP coalition. And that affects absolutely everything that we know from service delivery and passing of budgets. You know, are there prospects for ANC DA coalition? I don't know. All I can tell you is that if if and you know, ANC was willing, and I do have some you know some insights into it. DA is nowhere near that table. Um, this is a very art interesting article because uh, that I read in Business and full credit must go to Martin van Staden, and perhaps some of you know this, but I found this very interesting in the context of trying to solve South Africa's problems. And that is that South, Africa constitu South Africa's constitution, which is something I didn't know, creates three-tier government. And we always think about our government as being central government, then we've got provincial, then we've got municipalities. And in terms of the constitution, that is not right. In fact, municipalities have greater power than provinces. So actually the way to look at it is central government with wide authority, then you've got municipalities which have been given specific general constitutional authorities and then provincial governments are right at the bottom with limited rights. And you know, one of the things that falls onto municipalities is the provision of services and they are allowed to exercise that power in any which way they want. And the central government is actually under a constitutional obligation to listen to them. So the only way that provinces and provincial governments can step in is if muni municipalities literally fail, uh, at which stage you know, they can uh, go into this uh, supervisory uh, role where the provinces run the municipalities uh, and municipalities can be placed under administration. Uh, or don't want to perform the services. So all of a sudden you see a very strong shift in power, which has always existed to municipalities. And there is a very interested, interesting case that it's rolling itself through North Gauteng uh, High Court, uh, where we will see some judgments coming through end March and then end May again. And that is where UDM and 18 other litigants, and they all listed at the bottom, have applied for interdict one of them is to compel government to um, exempt essential services, so it's your hospitals, your schools from load shedding, and also to table a tangible uh, milestone-based uh, plan for ending load shedding. Now, Cyril Ramaphosa's response to the court papers that have been launched is that it is not the legal or constitutional obligation of the government, central government, to provide water and electricity, that that resides with municipalities in terms of the constitution. So that's a very, very important case in terms of the precedents that will be set going forward. It's absolutely fascinating. 
and you know how important are municipalities well they are absolutely essential uh, you know, the, the, and our topic talked about renewables very quickly just now, but it's very important to recognize, you know, we're placing all our hopes uh, on in terms of electricity, on solar and wind. But in fact, South Africa is one of the top 30 driest and water scarce countries in the world. We have one of the largest, if you can believe it, average water consumption in the world. And if you look at rent water, which supports about you know, 18 municipalities and uh, purifies uh, that water and then uh, provides it to municipalities water boards for resale, uh, within the rent water system, 5% of the water is lost, which actually is, is a very large number. 45% is lost within the muni municipality system. And that's a combination of leaks, illegal connections and non-payments. Now, the normal standard in the world in terms of that 45% is 15%. And there the major issues are obviously the, the unplanned settlements and unmetered connections, low infrastructure investment, which we all know, and that's not going to happen very quickly. The failure to pay, so municipalities not paying, uh, and then load shedding, which affects uh, pumping of water, water treatments, and so on. And just to give you an idea of how much money we need to spend, just rent water, just, just rent water, not the entire country. They have to build 12 reservoirs for 28 billion rent in the next five years to meet the demands of the growing population. So who wants to bet on uh, where that money is going to come from? So load shedding uh, and renewables, how, how you know, tangible is that hope? And unfortunately, not unlike what I've just told you about uh, elections and coalition governments, renewables are not the panacea that we're looking for. So what is renewable energy? It's basically energy that's spontaneous and inexhaustible, produced in nature without human intervention. And as we know, fossil fuels, coal, oil, oil, oil and gas are not renewable resources. Um, and then just a couple of data points, oil releases 50% uh, more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than natural gas and coal releases twice as much. Now, in terms of renewables, we only, you know, we often think about solar and wind, but there are a lot more sources of renewable energy. There is hydropower, which is, you know, we all know, that's why Western Cape has uh, load shedding at stage lower than uh, the rest of the country, because we can harness the energy produced by dams. Obviously, solar energy, um, which, by the way, if we could intercept solar energy, then that um, interception, that energy would generate 10,000 times greater energy that, than the uh, humanity at the moment requires. There is bioenergy, which is organic materials called biomass. So that's wood, charcoal, dung, other manures. Um, and that's currently being most used in rural areas, as we know, for, you know, in South Africa, cooking, lighting, heating, wind energy, onshore, offshore, we know, geothermal energy, where we can extract thermal energy from the Earth's interior. And if you think that's, you know, that that is theoretical, it isn't. My parents-in-law in the UK power the entire house through geothermal energy. And then there is ocean energy where you can uh, derive uh, energy from kinetic and thermal movement of water. Now, where are we? Well, we're in a disastrous space. So Paris Climate Agreement 2015, world leaders agreed that uh, in order to prevent any further effects of climate change, we need to limit global warming relative to uh, end of you know 2020 uh, end of 19th century industrial times by 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2. Point, uh, the, the warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Well, guess what? We are already sitting at 1.1 degrees Celsius above the benchmark, and the UN report predicts that uh, we will cross the two degree threshold, which is a complete disaster by the uh, 2030s. Now. Uh, what happens then? Greater flooding, greater droughts, greater heat waves, and we are already seeing some of that manifest itself. COP27 conference recently held where everyone is supposed to agree on the way forward, agreed to nothing. They've agreed to provide loss and damage funding to countries which are hit by climate change. 
that's absolutely great. There is absolutely no consensus on how we are going to mitigate against climate change. And as I was preparing this presentation, there is another report which has just come out from an international body, uh, IPCC, and that's literally last week. And that is the last report they're going to produce for a prolonged period of time, where they have now said that the current policies that are being adopted and discussed around mitigation will, are completely ineffectual. They will not help. And that our only hope is in um, this concept of carbon dioxide recapture, recapturing, which I will talk, uh, touch on in a second. Now, where are we, South Africa, in terms of renewables, where you all know we are nowhere? Uh, we are the 15th largest emitter of carbon dioxide in the world. 95% of our electricity is provided by ESCOM, and 84% of South Africa's energy is coal based. Um, this, and then this, I'll talk to solar and wind resources just now. But look at other countries, your Norway's, your New Zealand's, Brazil. They are deriving a lot of the electricity from renewables. So granted, Brazil, it's from, uh, from, from uh, biomass. Uh, but still, look at these percentages and look at 13.7%. Uh, it is pitiful. On a positive side, in terms of South Africa, well, we signed the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement, agreeing to a whole lot of things that we are not going to deliver on. Uh, in 2021, COP26 conference, we entered into this just energy transition partnership where developed markets have committed, and you would have seen the figure of 8.5 billion in funding being branded around to decommission our coal power plants and that is what we've just heard in terms of well we've got to allow some people to eat in order to to actually get that 8.5 billion so where are they going to be eating from well obviously this pot of money so it's a big question mark whether we will even get that pot of money now that this is splashed all over the financial times uh, in the uk um, again, on a positive side, cost of solar wind electricity construction falls below anything that we can build in terms of gas, nuclear and coal power stations, and the running costs would be very low. Um, now, on a negative side is the fact that the entire world is now rethinking the way they are thinking about climate change and what needs to what interventions need to, to put, put in place. And effectively, it's back to our only hope is in um, rethinking the way we are thinking about carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere. So if you look at the world, before fossil fuels came on, you know, in, into a space of thinking, the world existed in a bit of an equilibrium. So between land and oceans, so forests and water, uh, those two managed to um, mitigate the effects of and recapture sufficient amount of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to keep the world in an equilibrium in terms of uh, uh, temperature control. Then the men, 20, about 20 years ago, we intervened in the balance by extracting fossil fuels, which kind of lie you know, deep in the deeper layers of the earth. Um, and that is what really disturbed that equilibrium. So what is the solution? This is the newest thinking in the space. And some of it is now Brian Kitt on and, and mentioned Oxford Science Enterprises. This is where a lot of my knowledge comes from. Um, the latest thinking in the space is how do we focus on removing carbon dioxide emissions, not by planting more trees, but how do we, we do it in a chemi chemical way pumping chemicals into the atmosphere in order to capture and bond to the carbon dioxide and then store it permanently. Now, in terms of South Africa, this great hope of renewables, well, there's one, one point that everyone should be aware of. And that is that we are not the perfect country for uh, renewable energy such as solar and wind. Uh, and just as an example, you know, we've got very, very, very variable weather. So if one talks about building a solar plant or a wind plant, which generates, you know, it's a it's grand number, 100 megawatts, although that's not that much, but 100 megawatts solar power plant, in fact, it will generate only a third of the energy 
of the 100 megawatts um, capacity simply because of weather variability. So if one talks about 100 megawatt solar plant, you will only extract about 33 megawatts of actual energy out of it. So it is a third of the energy of a 100 megawatt coal plant. So you can see how, you know, for us, the cost of solar and wind is actually significantly higher than that of coal. And you can see how the government's focus is definitely not significantly on solar and wind energy. And then hydroelectricity, we don't have enough water. Grid capacity, it has all been built around areas of the country which are not ideal for capturing of solar and wind energy. So there is almost no way of connecting, as it stands at the moment, any significant amount of solar and wind energy into um, the grid. A current footprint in the space, negligible. We've got some little plants delivering, you know, some little megawatts. Again, divide everything by three. Uh, so we've got, we are nowhere in terms of solar and wind projects. And just to give you an idea of how expensive building a solar power plant is, there is a redstone solar plant being built in Northern Cape, 100 megawatts, so again, divide by three in terms of actual electricity, that will cost almost $12 billion to build, sorry, billion rand to build. And then you might have heard a lot about green hydrogen in terms of, again, Sir Ramaphosa stood up. He basically said, you know, that is also uh, a great hope for the future. By the way, uh, green hydrogen doesn't generate electricity for us. It's mainly a method of storing and transmitting energy, and it's produced by splitting oxygen from water. And then you use electrolyzers powered by electricity to derive to derive hydrogen, which will then transmit energy. Uh, that now this concept of green hydrogen comes from this concept that you can use the electricity for the purposes of generating hydrogen by using renewables and i've just told you that renewables are very difficult to come by in south africa um so as mentioned renewable energy again in the context of a big green hope for generating revenue as a country uh, in South Africa, renewable energy is more expensive to generate than coal. Um, and currently, you know, cost per kilometer in terms of usage of green hydrogen, which, by the way, at the moment is only used in lithium batteries, uh, the cost per kilometer of running an electrical car using a lithium battery is exactly the same as unleaded petrol. So where is the great hope? And I wish I had uh, a better news for you. South Africa has announced that we've got 300 billion rands worth of investment pipeline into green hydrogen projects. But guess what? With South Africa, and that's what Brian touched on, failed state, uninvestable country, that money is not going to materialize. And there we are talking, in this context, we're already talking about the only money on the table, eight and a half billion um, dollars is being eaten by people who have to eat. Uh, so where is the solution? And that is, by and large, the latest thinking. So I'm exposing you to the latest thinking in this concept of climate change, renewables, and carbon capture, capture with the carbon dioxide capture. It is innovation. It's this concept of pumping chemicals into the atmosphere, which I've already said will bond with uh, carbon dioxide and then mineralize it, literally turn it into rock. And that rock can then be used for, you know, in, in concrete or in plastics. And interestingly, two companies that I can point to, and I can point to a lot more in the OSC ecosystem, which are looking at this problem. Uh, we have a company in a portfolio called Wild Bioscience. And that's a company which has managed to increase crop yields by 20 to 30 percent. And they are actually moving into field trials this year. They've done it in the lab. They're moving into the field. Now, that's a bit of a game changer in terms of not having to cut down more forests uh, and create more of a, you know the land-based carbon dioxide recapturing. But it's obviously still early stages, although it has proof of concept in the bag. Then we have first light fusion, which is where you can derive clean energy from fusion. Fusion is what powers the sun. Um, 
first light fusion has now, you know, th this concept of being able to replicate fusion on Earth, and I can talk more about it in the OEC webinar, has been around for a long time. First light fusion has now proven that they can generate fusion using their, their particular approach. And US scientists have also recent recently proved this concept of net gain. Again, if you're not in the world of fusion, this is jargon, but it basically talks to the fact that you can produce more energy through fusion reaction than you need to deploy in generating fusion. So suddenly it becomes commercially viable. There's a lot more companies in the OSC ecosystem which are looking at how to mitig mitigate climate change, as well as a couple of companies which are working in the space of carbon dioxide recapture, which we are getting very, very uh, excited about. I actually, just before this webinar, I came up off a research call um, at Bravos and OSC, where we were talking at, about exactly those companies. So again, OSC webinar, if you want to know more. Now, I know I am finishing on a little bit of a, well, I'm hoping the technology bit kind of cheers you up a bit because the rest of it I'm I am you know I don't want to say negative about but I am negative about and you know I have a 27 year career in South Africa I in the, in the financial industry I arrived here when I was 12 I don't want to leave under any circumstances I love this country but I am out of ideas in terms of what we need to do to fix what we are facing right now. Thank you very much. We can see you, Tony, and we can see your slides. Sorry, small technical glitch there, Brian. We're up and running. I just need to switch into the correct view. Perfect. Afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for your time and interest. What I hope to do today is uh, unpack a little bit of the chaos for you and share with you why I think what we're seeing is, is in fact not bad for equities. Um, as usual, there is a fair amount of hysteria around the Fed's uh, positioning in the last day or so, and I'm going to uh, do my best to unpack that for you. Before we start, just a little brief introduction as to how we fit into the picture, and thank you very much to Brian for a nice introduction. Um, I represent uh, ThinkSell. We manage money on behalf of my plan. Brent is just a client of my plan. And for some time now, as Brent, as Brian mentioned, we have uh, been uh, had the honor of running the Global IP Opportunity Fund. And that fund has been very successful in providing returns to clients of Brent. The fund returns itself have been uh, quite ahead of the a multi-asset flexible median manager. And what we try and do in, in producing returns of this nature is to, to, to clearly focus on the upside, but uh, a significant portion of uh, the efforts that we put into the fund management uh, talk to risk mitigation on the downside. And uh, after a number of bear markets in my career, I've certainly... Um, come to understand that risk mitigation and downside risk management is as important to generating long-term returns as is, is picking good investments. As Matta has just said, there, there are a lot of companies out in the international marketplace uh, that are attractive. We continue to find attractive opportunities. Uh, and so really what we do in terms of looking at the uh, the, the macro environment and the, and the global landscape, as the name of the, the fund implies, is we look to, to harness those opportunities uh, and, and manage the macro risks as we go, go through, through the different cycles. <clears throat> the real focus of the Fed at the moment is, is inflation. Um, Paul, Paul's testimony in the last um, two days 
uh, spoke a lot about core inflation. And I think he's, he's telegraphing a very clear message. Um, he's going to keep interest rates higher for longer. And he wants to ensure that a large proportion of the inflation risk that we could face into the future uh, is, is mitigated. Why is this such a problem for the Fed? Um, the bulk of the problem really stemmed from the fact that as we went into COVID, a significant amount of money was pumped into support the US and indeed all countries around the world. If you have a look at the uh, scale of the introduction of new money, just to put it in some perspective for you, before COVID hit us, the US had about 50 trillion in notes and coins credit in circulation. By the time the Fed had uh, stimulated through COVID to support underlying economic growth, helicopter money, direct injection into the financial system, it had increased that by over 25%. Outside of a war environment, this is the biggest single injection of liquidity into the global financial system since the late 1940s. And the Fed's very well aware of the fact that too much money creates future inflation. So what the Fed has not been talking about is the need to, in Donald Trump's terms, drain the swamp. And so... The Ukrainian situation or the Ukrainian invasion came at a perfectly inopportune time. The Fed was already in the process of draining liquidity from the system. We had a supply side shock. We'd had the demand side shock from COVID. And that combination created quite a significant headwind for the Fed. And I think what the Fed is telegraphing to the market is that it is going to take time for inflation to come down and it is going to stay the course. Now, a lot of folk are very focused on the magnitude of the rate hikes. They have been very quick. They have been very sizable. But I think what a lot of commentators are not taking into account is that the Fed's objective has really been to re-establish real interest rates, the US real interest rate pattern. The Fed wants to maintain a real interest rate going back to around 2008 and prior to the global financial crisis of around one and a half to 2%. So if you step back and you put yourself in Powell's shoes a year ago, he had quite a mountain to climb. He had too much money in the system. He had a demand side shock from COVID. He had a supply side shock from Ukraine and COVID. And he also had an environment where real interest rates in the States were at about minus 1%. He had to reestablish a level of real interest rates which would not break the U.S. economy, it would not break the, U the U.S. labor market, but it would be sufficient to bring inflation down and sustainably so. And so when I have a look at the Fed and its statements and the behavior of the bond markets in relation to the Fed, um, I am not as unsettled as many other commentators. For those of you that are more technically inclined and want to go back in history, go back to about 2006 and Google the Fed's conundrum. It's a very interesting paper that was written. Greenspan at the time, prior to Dr. Bernanke coming in, remember we, we had the bottoming of rates in 2003. Uh, the Fed started to raise interest rates as the economy heated up. And I think it was in about 2005 that Greenspan commented, it didn't matter how much he raised interest rates, the bond market lowered rates. And that's a very important takeaway from today. 
The Fed conundrum, as it was then called, was about creating tighter or easier financial conditions. And if I can capture the whole of today's presentation just in one paragraph, it's this. The Fed is in the process of creating tighter financial conditions. We can see that in terms of the rate hikes, but the bond market is creating easier conditions. You would have read and heard about the inverted yield curve as being a precursor to recession, not necessarily so. A different interpretation is that the Fed in creating tighter financial conditions is creating the correct environment for inflation to come down sustainably so, and the bond market is acknowledging that by creating easier financial conditions. So the inverted yield curve is not a guarantee we're going to have a recession. The Fed has normalized real rates. That box is ticked. Inflation is on the way down. It will just take more time. And the Fed, given the banking crisis that we've had in the last month, has already started to provide more liquidity to the system. They've injected more liquidity in the last three weeks than they took out in the last three months. So for a lot of commentators that have focused on the economic doom and gloom scenario, I think it's a little premature to, to focus, forecast the next recession. If you have a look at the Wall Street Journal article of uh, the 3rd of January, I, I went through 500 strategists. The view was the same. Um, this year was going to be one of a deep economic recession. Uh, the Fed would have to pivot, inflation would come roaring down, and earnings would collapse. Uh, I think all of those strategists up until now have uh, been found to be wanting in the, in the prediction of, of this recession. I think the, the argument is a lot more nuanced. Um, I'm not sure earnings are going to collapse. That is not my base case. Inflation will come down, but slowly. The re-establishment of real rates has run its course. And the extent to which the Fed is focused on keeping financial conditions tight is not necessarily unhealthy. Everyone's looking for the Fed pivot. My counter argument to that is why should the Fed pivot? The Fed has re-established rates. Rates are at a level where the US economy can sustain itself. Yes, the cost of debt is higher, but a 3.5% funding rate is not excessive, and real rates are back to where they were prior to 2008. So I'm not really um, in the, the camp of, of doom and gloom at this point in time. In fact, quite the opposite, as I'll show you in a few slides time, we have been running the Global Opportunity Fund with an extremely high level of liquidity. Uh, the, the big run up in tech stocks in January this year, we captured very nicely and then went risk off. And, and now I'm looking to go back uh, risk on. So what's got a lot of folk um, concerned is the, is the uh, central bank index correlated with US economic activity. And, and there is quite a high degree of observable uh, correlation between these two. Uh, you can see the extent to which the withdrawal of liquidity from the system has caused folk to be concerned that uh, the lighter colored line being the purchasing managers index in the US would come tumbling down. Not my best case scenario. The labor market is still doing very well. We have a, a natural process of price contraction in some overheated markets. Uh, but the underlying signaling coming from the long bond market is not disturbing. If long bond yields in the States were to fall more quickly, or the dollar was to rise more quickly, I'd be a lot more concerned because that would suggest to me that the bond market is sensing a deep economic weakness. With yields below 4% on the 10-year, the two years come down, there's about a 100 basis point gap between the two-year and the Fed fund rate, I'm in a comfortable position that the Fed is creating sufficiently tight conditions 
to bring inflation under control. And the bond market is acknowledging that. The one thing equity markets don't like longer term is persistent and high inflation. And uh, so I think the interpretation is a little bit different. If you look at the market we have been through in 2022 and to date, I just superimposed it on the, uh, the history of bear markets. And as Brian very kindly introduced uh, my career, my first bear market was back in 87. So I've been through 87, 92, 94, 98, 02, 07, and, and again last year. And uh, the, the, the anatomy of a bear market is very important to understand. In the first phase, which lasts about nine months, you typically have a, a direct relationship between change in central bank policy, rising interest rates, equity market derates, uh, and, and some sort of structural adjustment to, to central bank policy. That's, that's typically the first phase. Um, second phase is, is a very important transition element. Second phase of the bear market normally occurs when you have uh, earnings destruction. And to, to argue that we're going to face a pattern very similar to 0773, in simple terms, something would need to break. The concern at the moment is something is breaking called SVB and various other banks, Credit Suisse, UBS. I'm not making light of the risks and the reason why we've got 30% in cash is we are mitigating some of these risks. But I think the difference is that central banks are alive to the liquidity risks and the volatility risks that exist and certainly have been supporting and underpinning those risks with liquidity, which wasn't the case when Lehman's went bang in 2008. So where would the S&P go to from here? There's a very interesting study that we did on macro bonds uh, to try and get a sense of, of what path we're following. The dotted line represents the previous inflation, sorry, inflation peaks going back through many cycles. The uh, line that you see over there is the median pathway of the S&P, and the black line is the path that we're following. So with the exception of a true economic collapse, uh, it is unlikely, in my view, not a high probability that we're suddenly going to metamorphosize into a phase two bear markets and, and C3,300 or below on the S&P 500. I, I think something dramatic would have to happen for, for that to occur. And the basis on which we look at trying to understand markets is, is represented in this slightly squiggly chart, which I will uh, explain in, in, in two sentences. On the horizontal axis, you've got the measure of volatility, the VIX index. Uh, that's read daily off uh, our Bloomberg terminal, CBOE VIX index. If the number goes up above 22 and a half, the volatility is increasing. If the number is below 22 and a half, the number is decreasing. And the vertical axis is just very simply. In so you've got uh, 10 minus two year spreads. A uh, simple way to think about this chart is if you're in the top right-hand corner, you're in recessionary conditions. If you're in the bottom right-hand corner, you're in contractionary conditions. We go from recession to stimulus to growth to contraction. Very, very eloquent and simple model to follow. At the moment, counterintuitively, we are here. We had moved through 2022 in contractionary conditions. And we're not moving up at the moment into uh, recessionary conditions. Um, and, and that's slightly against the, the popular opinion at the moment. If we were in recessionary conditions, the outcome would be very different. So what I've done in analyzing this particular chart is I've taken the returns from all the MSCI sectors, and I've had a look to see how each sector performs 
under different economic conditions. And the results are very interesting. When you're in a growth environment, very clear, tech stocks do very well, as do your consumer stocks. When you move into a contractionary phase, your consumer stocks do relatively poorly, as do your tech stocks. And as we experienced last year, your energies and your financials do relatively better along with your healthcare and your utilities, your more defensive stocks. If we were moving up into a recessionary condition, we would be heading to a world of pain. Everything would be doing poorly. Financials, energy, consumer discretionary, and IT a little bit less. And, and that's not my base case for the rest of 2023. Once we've been through a recessionary environment, we then go into stimulus. There is an increasing probability that we have to consider recessionary environments for 2024, but uh, I think that's an evolving story that we need to look at a little bit more carefully. So if you keep this chart in mind and just ask yourself, how, what has the landscape been like as we've moved into 2023? The Smarty Box chart is quite interesting, and I'll flip back just to give you perspective in a moment. The sectors that have been performing very well uh, in 2023, and what supposedly is uh, a precursor to a recession, have been communication services, information technology, and discretionary. Before we did the webinar this morning, I had a quick look to see what NVIDIA was up year to date, 77%. Uh, that would not be consistent with the recessionary economic environment. So if you take the combination of these two, I think we're oscillating somewhere between growth and contraction, but I think a lot of other things would have to happen before we started to move into a recessionary environment. And my key indicators would be to watch the VIX, the move index on, on Bloomberg, the, the option volatility adjusted index. I would look to be concerned if US bonds moved significantly lower. And I'd look to see if liquidity stress increased. Those would be for me the key signals. I'm not that worried about inflation. Inflation's going to come down. Powell, in my view, is doing the right thing. He's keeping uh, financial conditions uh, tight. And as long as the bond market itself is comfortable that there is no accident, it will create easier financial conditions. And paradoxically, that's quite a good time for an active equity manager like myself to be picking up stocks. So where are we positioned in the portfolio? Um, it's a high quality portfolio. You can see consistent with our thesis as to which sectors are going to perform. We are overweight discretionary and staples. We are overweight information technology and rather underweight financials. And uh, for you to sort of view on at your leisure, you can see all the stocks on the right-hand side. Uh, I've tended to go for companies that have a very dominant margin and are able to, to grow their businesses in these economic times and balance the risk and reward through having a combination of defensive stocks and uh, higher growth stocks. But the bulk of the returns in the portfolio that you saw have come from investments in things like Hermes, LVMH, NVIDIA, which is completely counterintuitive if we were going to go into a market which uh, was represented by a deep economic slowdown. So Brian, just in conclusion, um, I think inflation in the US will decline but uh, it's going to remain sticky. The Fed is, is near the end of its hiking cycle. I, I don't see the need to pivot. Uh, the US is not running out of growth. I, I think that's a misguided economic uh, framework to think about. I think the US bond market itself had started to reflect the high inflation outcome. In the last week, uh, that has changed. Uh, central, central banks will be more accommodative given the liquidity risks. And uh, one, one major message to leave you with is, is that the, the, the inverted yield curve is not a, a guarantee of recession. It's a sign of tight versus uh, loose financial conditions. 
Uh, and if there is one thing that, that does concern me, that keeps me awake at night, uh, is if we have too strong a movement in the dollar, we could find a ripple effect into something like the Chinese one, and we could see a currency dislocation. And I think that would be a lot bigger than the banking crisis or banking issues that we're dealing with at the moment. So net net, I see opportunity. I'm I'm positive, but I'm very mindful of the uh, the risks, and that's why we're sitting with thirty percent of cash in your fund. Brian, thank you very much. I'll hand back to you. Thanks, Tony. We're going to hand over to JC now for his uh, share portfolio presentation. JC, over to you. Right, you should be able to see, Brian. Yeah, we can see. Thank you. Nice stuff. Thank you very much for the intro. Um, also realized that I'm sort of 25 years in the market. Um, been on both sides of the table. Been a private client uh, service agent, been a product creator, create a um, product buyer. So uh, my portion of this presentation is, is to basically, following Magda and uh, Tony's intro, is basically to look at product, how you can utilize. We are living in turbulent times. We are living in um, uncertain times. And I think, um, yeah, many people joke about um, long-term being post-lunch uh, or two-day holding period, et cetera. So how do you go about in this market? How do you do investments? What type of product do you consider? And I, so hopefully I can help there. So today, first of all, DFM Global, if you don't know the company yet, there's something like a, a DFM. A DFM is an actual function. It's a discretionary fund manager. It's normally an expert in investment management um, in a certain product, whether it's uh, unit trusts, whether it's share portfolios, it'll be a asset consultant, but it will be a discretionary fund manager, just to put it out there. Now, Brentus and DFM, I'm going to discuss how we link up, what's the benefit of a link up. Um, I'm just going to look at PSPs or personal share portfolios. The acronym gets used because it's too long to write out. Um, who should consider PSPs? Uh, maybe a bit of a portfolio construction, a mock markup. So how do we use shares? How do we combine shares to construct a portfolio? And then obviously how we constructed it and how our portfolios have done uh, recently. Now, like I said, in 25 years, it's a long time. And wanting to show a slide what 25 years looked like, we started taking major events and then we realized no slide is big enough. And I think we've lived through uh, terrorist attacks. We've lived through unknown viruses. We've lived, lived through dot coms, wars, great inflations, uh, subprime crisis. It, it's been an eventful time. And I think what have we learned from, from say 25 years in the market, um, that no one's bigger than the market. I always say this, leave your ego by the door when you do investments. You are not bigger than the market. The market will keep you humble. So I think the, the only, only tip I can give anyone out there who's doing his own investments, um, keep it simple, really keep it simple, keep it direct and keep a close eye on the costs. So how do we link up? I mentioned, a DFM and Brentus. Now, this is where advice meets the product effectively. You've got a, a, a SA top rated boutique wealth manager. Um, they've got the trophies to show it. And then you link up with an expert share portfolio uh, house like, like DFM. And a share portfolio or a PSP, like I've said, there's a fancy explanation for it. But it's basically you open an account in your own name and you buy and sell Anglos, MTN, Statabank, Amazon or Facebook, all in your own names. So it's a very practical solution. It's very direct, real-time, transparent. You can see everything happening. So it's a, it's a wonderful product. So there are many benefits to a share portfolio in your solution um, with one big drawdown effectively. So I'm going to cover that first because all the marketing books tell you, you should uh, say your weakness up front. The only drawdown of a share portfolio is effectively the transactions being in your own name or the transactions taking place, um, opening up for tax costs, etc. So this is where the link up of the advice and the product actually works very well. Because if you speak to someone at Brentist and they can see whether the product fits into your solution, how they can optimize the tax aspect of it, it becomes a very, very good product. Now, I mentioned it's integrated. It is transparent. I mean, remember, everything is real time. The same login I get to buy your Anglers or your Standard Banks or whatever, your ETFs, 
You also get the same login, so you can see what I'm doing real time, but so does the advisor. And I'll explain this a little bit deeper because imagine you and your advisor sit and you do formal planning. You look at all your cash flows, when your kids are going to varsity, when you need to replace your car, et cetera. And you draw up that plan, exactly what you want to do. You wrap it up, tape it up, and send it by courier to someone else. You don't know what happens in the box. You don't know whether they receive the box. You don't know what investments they're buying. That doesn't work well. So having your product integrated with what your advisor planned for you and what you're expecting to happen is very important. You can see and you can check up and you can actually participate in what's happening. So it's where the actual implementation of a plan meets the plan. And then of course, like I said, it's cost effective. Um, and we'll see the cost effectiveness of it shortly. Now, when we think about PSPs or share portfolios, you can broadly categorize yourself. It's basically the clients who already have share portfolios. Now, I'm speaking to you now. You went to your bank because you wanted to buy a house. So you took out a bond. You need a credit card. You need a check account. The bank was actually quite good at it. So that's their niche. That's their expert. That's their area of um, expertise. Then, I don't know, if you took out a life policy, maybe a will, uh, your estate is looked after, and a share portfolio. Are they necessarily the best for your, your will, your share portfolio? They could be, but they're not experts at it, are they? So in this instance, moving your share portfolio to your expert share portfolio managers, I don't do home bonds or credit cards. We just do share portfolios. Um, and then you'll say, well, well, how do I move? Is it a big process? No, the transfer doesn't cost anything. You don't trade to move it. We just move it for you. It's an admin process. We do the admin process. And because there's no trade, there's no cost, there's no tax. So effectively you can move from wherever you are to Brentis, and they can actually incorporate it into your planning, which will make a lot more sense. And then you've got the guys who, who know the benefits. They've been at a bri where the guy said, I recently bought transaction capital because it bombed out and I'm making so much money. And you want the share portfolio, but you don't really know or looked into it. What's the cost? How long does it take, etc.? Well, the answer is easy. Uh, it costs nothing to open. There's no inception costs. There's no admin costs. Uh, the timeline is if you give us all the documentation, it takes two days, 48 hours. So it's quick, it's easy, it's cost-free. And again, it can be integrated now into your holistic solution. And then the third box would be people who leave the investment to the husband or wife, people who have never really looked at it. They invest in their company pension fund. I don't know, they must be doing a good job. They also, I think probably number one to go visit an advisor to say, listen, what's happening there? Is it best for me? Is it, is it servicing my needs? What can I do to improve that? So, okay, share portfolio is a product. So how do we use it? If you look at, okay, if you diversify a pension fund, we just mentioned a pension fund. If you invest in a pension fund, they will diversify it. Regulation 28 compliant or Pension Fund Act, et cetera. They would buy equities, bonds, cash, property, gold, other stuff. And you will have a pie, like you can see top left. So looking at the South African global balanced category. So everyone participating in the, the CISA global multi-asset high equity, et cetera. So looking at the sector average at the moment, they're about 57.5% in equity, about 17% in bonds, 11 in cash, about 3% in property. Now, to show you a, a, the difference that cost can make to your solution is the average cost of the sector, the category, is going to give you about, it's going to cost you about 161, so 1.61%. If you construct it in a share portfolio, and you can just shave off the cost by, you can see, buying Vanguard Total Market ETF, it's about 0 0.07 cost, iShares Global 0.1, and I'm using global big brands just for as an example. And let's say we could use those ETFs to emulate exact returns of the sector for the past 15 years. No outperformance, no underperformance, we just ran the same route as the sector, but the cost difference resulted in a savings of about 214,000 Rand over the 15 year period on a million bucks investment. Now, I don't know about you, if I went to you said, you've got 214,000 in your bank account, what would you do? I'll probably put up solar panels because we don't have electricity anymore, but anyways, so there's a solution you can use a share portfolio to emulate what a sector would give you, but at a reduced cost. So it is very, very effective.
Now, we do have this as a portfolio. We call it the, the Global Passive Patterns ETF, where we do buy ETFs, um, index ETFs, to basically emulate the asset allocation of the balance sector. Today, we're going to just focus on the Global Active Top 25, giving you access to 25 large cap franchise well-known companies. And of course, we've got the same strategy, just in local. But as I said, for focus, we're going to look at the global um, process. Now, everyone's always going to give you, they've got, uh, I don't know how many analysts, they've got fancy systems, they've got fancy degrees. Yes, you need all of that. But as I said right in the beginning, you need a healthy dose of keep it simple. You need to keep it real simple. And obviously, work smarter, not harder. So let's look at constructing a portfolio. If you invested a million bucks, what would you do? How would you start? Where would you start looking? I'm going to give you one simple um, alternative to just going out and listening to what your friend at the price said. South Africa has got roughly 250, 300 um, equity uh, style unit trusts you can choose from. It's a lot. So we can start there. But why, why stay there? Having less than 300 funds in the SA and about 70,000 funds worldwide. So on the right-hand side, you can see ETFs alone would be about eight, 9,000 ETFs, and it's growing fast. As you can see, in the past five years, it went from about 5,000 ETFs to about 9,000 ETFs. So the market outside of SA is growing. SA is not even 1% of the total equity funds worldwide. So this is, well, maybe a better question is, how much of your money or your equity is invested in SA? Is it more than 1% or less than 1%? Now, listening to the commentators, listening to what the market looks like, uh, it, is, it is quite negative out there. Um, not everything is negative. You can go seek out growth, as Tony explained, but let's start again. Let's look at a process. And let's use a quick analogy. If you had to construct a the best rugby team in the world, would you start at, I'm living in the Western Cape, so would you start at your school? Like, let's go, Paul Boys Eye. Good rugby. Mm. Western province, yeah, decent. Springboks, very good. But would you construct a team with just them? Or would you go out worldwide and pick a couple of New Zealanders, maybe some English players, and construct a team of 15 that's really star-studded all-star? Well, naturally, the answer is quite easy. Now, if you could then get that team to go play any other team that I've just mentioned, even on a bad day, should they miss a kick or a, or a pass, even if you don't put them together before the game, they've got no training time. They would still be very good because of their underlying skill of each player. So on a bad day, they're probably still out of ball. And I think that's the concept I want to bring across with the share portfolio. The universe we construct, even on a bad day, should perform in terms of consistency. So looking at the model, we, went, we keep mentioning the word consistency. And I just want to quickly, on the left-hand side, what does consistency mean? Left bottom. If you've got 70,000 funds and you start filtering them to reduce, you can't work with 70,000 funds. And you go out and you look at, say, a specific strategy, maybe global, large cap, um, SP 100, SP 500, Acqui included, doesn't matter. You can pick which strategy you want. Look for, say, a five year track record. If they don't have a five year track record, how do you really do numbers on them? If the guy have a five year track record and he left last month, that track record doesn't belong to the company or the manager anymore. So you've got you to just do some work. You look at the fund, you look at its performance, and you assign, you'll see bottom left, whether you was quartile one, two, three, or four for that month. And let's look at 60 months, and he's got a score for 60 scores. End of it, you're going to add it all up and see what his average score for that 60 periods were, that was. And effectively, you're going to rank your funds and find the top 10 best, most consistent players in the market after starting with 70,000. Now, those 10 managers obviously need to do uh, manager research, quantitative, qualitative, everything. But let's breeze through that. Now we're going to construct a top 25 share portfolio using that universe. Um, their tilts, uh, whether they are negative, positive, factor biased, et cetera. You need to do some risk management. This is what a DFM does. We, we, we construct portfolios. So we take the assets, we construct it using fact exposure, position sizing, just what type of risk we're going to allow into this portfolio. And I think if you, you sort of kept up with the whole explanation, you're going to ask, well, did it work? Uh, yes. 
Otherwise, I wouldn't have shown it. But if you look at the right hand side, and equities is a long term investment, it's a five to seven years commitment. But so taking sort of two year rolling returns, if you were in the portfolio for two years rolling subsequent, so, so 2018, 2019, and onwards, um, you can see the quartile that the portfolio returns represented sort of quartile one. Now, quartile one just means you're in the top 25% of the sector. That, this is the fancy way. But to be in the top half of the sector is, is well done. It's better than the average. And it's exactly where a, a fund aims to be. And you can see only for a brief period, it went to quartile two. So the construction of it is simple. Everyone can agree with the rugby team, your players will be good. And it turns out they are actually good. So why make it more complicated? Why introduce egos and big brands? And it, it just works. And on the left-hand side, you can see the cumulative return um, of the blue line, again, outperforming quite handsomely. Now, please, past performance is not an indication of future performance and, and, and all the disclaimers. It's not to show off the performance. It's to show off how simple this formula is and how well it worked. And there's no reason why it shouldn't continue to work. Now you can go and say, well, Tony just showed us that the world is, is collapsing I mean, uh, banks are falling over. Credit Suisse um, was, a, a, was a big name that, um, that sort of hit the wall. And I saw, I think the best joke was, I mean, yeah, it's not a big bank anymore. The company was smaller than Crocs, the, uh, the rubber slippers when it collapsed. So it wasn't a big bank anymore, but it was a big event. And looking at it year to date, again, very short period, but did your portfolio work? Are you gonna go and say, uh, if I could scroll, yes, it did, year to date. And there's a couple of things I want to show in the slide. The Obviously, the portfolio is on the right-hand side, that light blue line, that's about 6%. So call it, it's top 10% of the sector. Next thing I want to show you is the red line, the ACQUI. I showed it with the globe. The ACQUI is the all-country um, index. It's basically an uh, index constructed to represent the whole world with an equity, developed and emerging market. So it's a good benchmark for everyone. And to realize that, call it two thirds of the sector did not outperform that benchmark um, the past year to date. So in during trying times, the benchmark actually beats us or beat the sector. Um, and this yet this portfolio strategy continued to work. And now you can say, well, you were active, you bought and sold, you went to cash, you went to equity. No, um, here's the top 10. And what's good to see, similar to Tony's portfolio, um, the same names being used. I mean, these names are specifically filtered through from starting with 70,000, aiming to get to the big blue chip franchise established multinational companies. And looking at it's Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet is just Google for those who don't know, and Johnson Johnson, et cetera. I think the one name you might not know is Abby, uh, bottom left. They're the guys that own Botox effectively, but yeah, they do a lot more than that. And when you look at it and say, right, but this is a dollarized portfolio, this is a US traded portfolio, and you're right, that, that's all true. But when you look at the ACQUI bottom right again, the ACQUI being the all country world index, um, it's about 60% US. And when you look at where these companies actually generate their revenue from, their earnings from, et cetera, these are world companies traded in the US, franchise names, dependable names, and will be around. And during uncertain times like we're living in now, where banks are falling over, inflation is sky high, and rates are going up, these shares have shown to be quality. And it's exactly what we're aiming to get. So this is the top 10. Now, again, it's a, it's a good product, a brief product, the breakdown, how we do it. And I think the, the point to bring it all back to where advice and the product comes links up. You can use a share portfolio. You've got a pension fund. You've got a retirement annuity. You've got a living annuity preservation fund. Who knows what you've got? You can include. You don't have to buy just Unitrust. You don't have to buy the known products. You can actually blend a share portfolio. Whether you've got one, want one, don't know if you want one, have a portfolio or not, you can include it. Just speak to an advisor. And what will happen next is they will look at it and say, right, do you have the risk, the risk appetite for it? Um, will it actually add value? Is your structure already optimized for cost and performance, et cetera? Um, so you need to sit with one of these guys. They're all capable and very nice people. We work with them daily. And you can use the, the major platforms, put it in these, these wrappers, and hopefully find the same benefit we think you can. But yeah, thank you very much, Brian.
JC, thank you very much for that. And, and ladies and gentlemen, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, we have now um, a solution for share portfolios. Historically, we predominantly invested across you know, trust portfolios, both off offshore and locally. We've now got accessibility to a share portfolio solution. Um, and I think the cost effectiveness of a share, share portfolio certainly makes sense. Um, and, and I found that a lot of my clients who have share portfolios or one share portfolios, you know, are very interested in terms of the individual stocks that are bought within those investment solutions. And, and, and that's where share portfolio we think is going to be a, a really nice addition to the suite of solutions that Brentos offers our clients. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to, to hand over, first of all, thank you to all the speakers for their time, Magda, um, Tony and, and, and JC. I think what we're going to do now is we're going to hand over to a Q&A session. There has been a couple of questions that have come through um, and maybe I can kick it off. Uh, John has asked any comments from anybody on CITES tax. And I think this is a very, very important question that is not necessarily always thought about and, and certainly needs to be considered from an offshore investment perspective. CITES tax is basically the tax on the site or jurisdiction in terms of where the asset is held. So if it's an offshore share portfolio, for example, or a unit, uh, a property, offshore property, I mean, one needs to consider the implications of CITES tax. And that includes the tax that would be liable in that particular jurisdiction, whether it be dividends tax, capital gains tax, and or death duties. Now the US and the UK, for example, uh, they are CITES tax applicable. And, and, and in the US, the exemption on uh, death duties is 60,000 dollars and in the UK it's 325,000 pounds. So you know that, that certainly needs to be considered in your financial planning uh, and in addition obviously all the additional taxes in terms of CGT and dividends tax. And one solution that we've been advising clients to consider from an investment perspective is to wrap that into an endowment structure. An endowment structure takes care of that. There's no CITES tax liable once you use that, in, uh, that endowment structure to any of the other jurisdictions because it's a South African structure uh, that is set up and liable only to SARS. And also there may potentially be some benefits from a tax perspective there, depending on the tax uh, marginal tax rate of the, of the investor. So that is one solution for that, John. I hope that answers your question. Um, and then we have a couple of other questions. We've got uh, books has asked with interest rates high, expensive US and European markets, where to go with the RAN? Now, this is also again a very, um, common question that we get, and in terms of uh, exchange rates um, or interest rates, should I say, I mean, obviously with the high interest rates, there are solutions that we've been using quite extensively for clients who are also looking for a lower risk solution to equities, because we under, obviously uh, equities have, have higher um, risk associated to them. And one, of the, one, one such solution is an income blend that we've utilized quite successfully since about 2015, I think, the return that investors have got, which is a combination of income funds locally in South Africa, they've achieved a return of just over 9%, uh, which is very attractive in a high volatility uh, scenario like we saw in 2022. Um, really not a bad return if one considers how volatile markets were over the last year. So that's one solution. And or, you know, if you're looking to get into the market, um, so one, one needs to look at where are the opportunities and and uh, the U.S. certainly has been expensive, especially if one goes back to, to uh, 2021, at the end of 2021. Maybe, you know, having a look now in terms of the market having fallen last year uh, into 2023, interest rates obviously getting to a point where uh, they may potentially start slowing down dramatically, if not, um, you know, halting altogether at some point in the near future, as, as Tony pointed out. And, and you know, there, there, there certainly is opportunity there with high quality businesses. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, some of those um, stocks uh, in, in the stock market across the board, you know, I mean, I think the NASDAQ alone last year was down 32%. And some of those high quality businesses in that particular sector, and I'm only using that as an example, there, there's many other examples, uh, we're down 30, 40, 50, 60%. And there's some really good quality opportunities where one could kind of build that into a share portfolio solution, for example. Um, so, so, and 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 of course, uh, just to to come back to interest, uh, it's not interest rates, um, exchange rates. I think someone asked something about exchange rates in terms of whether this is the right time to buy now. But this is a question we get asked often. And um, 
you know, it's it's a difficult call. I mean, I think one must consider it was Chris. Chris, if I want to move funds to US offshore investments, do I wait for the rand to strengthen or do I move the funds now irrespective of the rates using a long-term view? Now, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, if you go back over the last five years, the rand has depreciated by about 50% against the dollar over five years and over 10 years i think i looked at the numbers uh, more recently it was about seven seven point two percent per annum it's declined over the last 10 years now you've got to take a view on that going forward where's the rand going to go sure uh it's a lot weaker than it has been in a long time and and i think uh towards the end of last year beginning of this year it was at 1670 1680 and now suddenly we're at 1850. do we hold off the dollar also is a lot stronger as a result of interest rates having increased quite uh, dramatically over, over the last year as the Fed increased interest rates. And that potentially, once interest rates halt, could um, see a weaker dollar coming forward, which means that, you know, it, it, it's such a difficult call. There's so many influencing factors when it comes to currencies. Um, and, and we prefer on an offshore investment, when you're taking an investment offshore and investing offshore in the first place, that that's going to be a long-term investment. And if you take a longer term view that the RAND is con going to continue to decline uh, at some rate, um, you know, going forward, then, um, you know, one one has to uh, sort of make a call in terms of where they're going to buy that currency. But it's, it's, it's a very difficult call to make over the short term. And certainly over the longer term, we do think that the RAND is probably going to continue um, depreciating rather than appreciating. Although, as I say, the dollar could potentially um, uh, weaken over the short term as, as interest rates uh, halt a little bit. Um, Benji Pillay, where's options of investing post-retirement tax-free money into uh, other than fixed deposits at the bank? And, and, and they are touched on, obviously, an income solution could potentially be a solution for you. I mean, those income solutions, the blended income solution we use, um, I think over the last year was a little bit lower than the 9% since 2015. It was just under 8 um, but but over the longer term, um, you know, depending on how long you're going to be investing that for, a 9% return is certainly nothing to sneeze at. Um, right, let's just see if there's any other questions for... Um, let's just see. Uh, will the slides presentations be made available? Yes, they will be. We will be sending all of you a copy of the presentation as well as the slides, which is in the presentation. I think Delian uh, will be sending that out tomorrow, as far as I know. Just one last comment back on that um, CITES tax. Uh, one of our advisors, Suzanne Haman, has actually written a piece on that, and it is available on MoneyWeb. So you can also go and have a look at that, John, and I hope that helps. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I think that concludes this afternoon's presentation. We've run out of time. I just maybe a Concluding notes, I think, uh, you know, next year, Brenthurst Wealth will be 20 years old. It's been quite a journey from when we first started in a small office in the Foyers area to one of the largest independent wealth managers in the country with 23 highly qualified financial advisors, most of whom have acquired the certified financial planning designation plus various other qualifications. Behind the scenes, we have a total of almost 70 staff members countrywide who are an integral part in trying to offer the best advice and manage client portfolios of our ever increasing number of clients, mostly all in the so high called uh, so called high net worth category. We're excited with the imminent opening of our office in George, headed up by Ruan Breit, bringing the total number of our countrywide offices to nine and one in Mauritius. For further information, please mail us on invest at brenthurstwealth.co.za. That's invest at brenthurstwealth. .co.za, or alternatively visit our website on www.bwm.co.za and contact any of our offices countrywide. Thank you and good afternoon.